Hamilton. But why don't you why don't you tell us a little bit about the history behind the original mm-hmm. debate uh, that that we we put together and and why was, we want to model it after Hitchens? I was just gonna I was gonna segue into that because you've done a perfect job of setting it up. It actually starts off the story really. Uh, the story started where you guys at were we had become sort of in contact and started communicating and being friendly. And you guys were interested in actually having like a proper debate. And so in this instance, because you were more interested in engaging directly with people who are anti-feminist or on that side of the other side of the fence, um, I offered to be the moderator in this case. And the question that was developed was, is feminism good for the world? And, and the idea was to model it on the Hitchens-Blair debate on um, is religion a force for good in the world or a such some, such some similar title. And so we talked about it, how, you know, we kind of went back and forth about, well, how would we do it and how would it be fair? And, you know, what would the rules be? Because it wasn't just like, yeah, let's debate and then negotiate the rules afterwards. It was like, okay, well, here, here's our debate and here's what we propose we do so that people understood what they were, we were getting into. And, uh, and then it just sort of sat uh, with crickets around it and tumbleweeds going past that offer went up online and, and was, went unanswered, I think, for um, uh, maybe some minor people like anonymous people on Twitter agreed to do it, but there weren't any um, channels that were going to take up the offer. Is that your basic memory of how it went? That's right. That's right. And, and Hitchens was a hugely instrumental in inspiring us to become vocal atheists and uh, to indeed be skeptical of not only the positions that we, we then ended up disagreeing with, but also our own. And um, yeah, we really miss uh, the style of debate that, that used to happen in his day, which wasn't really that long ago. And um, so we, we were excited to, to try and bring some of that back uh, to, to the, the online community. Yeah, because the nice thing about a formal debate is that both sides get to lay out their points. So, you know, you have to, you know, if you're going to listen to a debate, like I'm a big fan of um, Professor Bart Ehrman, and he debates uh, apologists from time to time and you get to hear they both sides lay out their positions and then during the rest of the debate they kind of have their disputes around what have they've sort of laid out as the terms of the debate that answer that question and so the idea of someone making a statement and then having to explain it and someone else challenging him and then defending it obviously is something that um is quite challenging to religion because it sounds good if you just say it and nobody has a chance to respond. But when you have a chance to respond, then it gets a lot harder to answer really tough questions. And so it's a good proving ground. And it also gives you an opportunity to hear people basically make their best arguments. Right. And, and the thing is that everybody, I think, really wanted to, to see a debate like that, including Sargon's fans. And um, so it, it was a really kind of interesting, and I, and I know everybody went in there with like their, their gladiatorial style kind of tribalism on their shoulder, and, and, and that's fine, you know, people enjoy themselves, and uh, uh, however they felt the debate went, uh, of course, it's, it's very uh, subjective. Um, th- there are, the point is that, that Sargon's fans and, and, and your fans and just Feminists and anti-feminists in general wanted to uh, wanted to see this happen, and and we I felt very much provided. So good on you. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it was um, people in my comments saying you should debate Sargon. You should debate Sargon. And the mantra just was appearing so frequently. I thought that that he had actually made an offer that I wasn't aware of, and that you know we were um, that there was sort of a challenge laid down, and you know became such a common thing. You should debate Sargon. You should debate Sargon. I'm like, well, that's fine. I'll debate Sargon. Just like. That's, let's set it up. And I think when that's, I can't remember all the sequence of events, but it basically became the situation where I, I think I said to you guys, look, we already have the question and the format. Would you guys just switch places with me and I'll be this, one of the speakers and you'll be the moderator instead. And I think that's kind of how it, uh, and then I think you guys reached out to him to approach the topic of a debate because Sargon and I really don't have civil interactions on Twitter. Um, so mostly it's him bothering me, but uh, yeah, we, I think you guys um, reached out and, and he agreed, but there was about a six week delay between four to six weeks from my recollection between when we made the agreement and when we set the date because I had conferences to go to and I knew I wanted time to prepare for the debate because I've never done a formal debate. That was actually my first formal debate that I've ever done in my life. And I wanted to give myself enough time to adequately prepare for it so that I would do a good job. 
Well, you uh, you certainly seem like you knew what you were doing. So that's, that's actually quite astounding to hear that was your first. Um, but yeah, we, we did reach out to Sargon and, and he was quite keen on it. Um, the A lot of the back and forth that ended up happening after that was uh, just trying to decide on the, the big topic, I guess. And uh, I know a lot of people complained that it was, it ended up being too broad, but uh, just like with the introductions, I like to remind everybody that both debaters did agree to it. So um, to their yeah, and, side of it. And afterwards, I don't know if people know this, but after the debate, almost immediately, we were sort of still in, in some kind of com conversation for the few, first few hours after the debate. And we had, he, he had complained about the question. I thought, okay, that was fair enough. And we talked about a second debate because he wanted to debate patriarchy. And um, I said, that's fine. We can debate patriarchy. And then he came back saying, well, come get back to me when you formulated a question. And I thought, well, no, we formulated this question and you had to put up with it. So I think it would be fair if you formulated the question about patriarchy and then we'll just take the appropriate opposing sides and then just like heard nothing. Yeah, yeah, uh, unfortunately. So that offer was made. So an offer for a second debate with his own question wording was was made to Indeed. remedy the question wording we had, you know. Indeed, and that, that would have been a really, perhaps still will be a very interesting uh, debate to hear, well, whether it's Sargon or someone else that takes you up on it. Um, the, uh, the whole patriarchy thing, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of rolled eyes every time that word is uttered. So it's, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to, to hear a proper defense of, of uh, the theory. Mm. Yeah, and then speaking of, uh, if you're interested, I can tell you a little bit of how I prepared for the debate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, please, by all means. It's like, you know, sort of um, autodidactic here, self-taught. So I guess probably like a lot of YouTube atheists, I spent a lot of time watching Hitchens' debate. And uh, my, my two favorite debaters are Hitchens and Professor Bart Ehrman. And so I was familiar with the structure of a debate and the styles of the debate and the, the phases of a debate. But I had never really thought that much about the construction of a debate argument. So when I had agreed to the debate, I rewatched old debate videos, but with a very different eye. And instead of watching it to hear the arguments, I was watching it to listen to how they were constructing their arguments. How did they answer the question as it was given in the debate as a debate topic? Um, how did they build their arguments? How did they use emotion? How did they use logic? How did they use examples? How did they use tragedy? How did they use humor? all these kinds of things. And then the other thing was, uh, I, it was around that time of my preparation that uh, Carl had appeared on the um, Dave Rubin, the Rubin Report, but it wasn't Dave Rubin, it was some other guy, Michael Brooks, I think. And he had not put in a stellar appearance and there were people on YouTube who had, were doing critique, critique videos on his appearance. And I ended up watching, uh, one of those in particular was very, very helpful because he kept showing how Carl would be given the floor and then he would use that time to answer the question thereby giving the floor back to the person who had just been talking and then he had this habit of doing that just con instead of using his time giving it away and just sort of notice some of the uh, weaknesses that he had in his appearance on that show it was really helpful that this person made a, a youtube video pointing all of them out so I was like oh okay these are good notes i'm gonna like pay attention to those and then when it came to actually preparing for the debate, I knew the structure. So I knew I had 10 minutes to start and then we were gonna have two response times and then a finishing statement. And That's it's, right. yeah, and it's quite obvious from watching debates that if you watch what they do, um, that each person will give their side and they will usually be prepared remarks. And while one person is speaking, the other person is, has their head down and they're furiously taking notes. And then the other person will give their prepared remarks and then they'll start their responses. And while the other person, the second person is speaking, the first person is taking copious, copious notes. And that's because in the next phases, they're really just reacting to what's been presented and, and looking for weaknesses in each other's arguments or presenting weaknesses or explaining why observed weaknesses are not really weaknesses. And they have a debate, that's, that's what they do. And I decided I wanted to do my prepared 10 minutes and then I was going to not do a prepared five minute closing because I wanted to be able to be a little bit flexible in terms of how I wanted to wrap up my themes. And of course, for the response bits, you just kind of have to be able to think on your feet. So um, when it came to answering the question, is feminism good for the world? I re recalled my days as a graduate student in Britain, unlike 
people in America, I don't know how it works in Canada or the parts of the world, but British universities, students for their final exams, their summer exams, they do a three hour SAT exam. So you go into this big large room with desks and they give you a little like notepad of paper, a little um, like, yeah, essay writing thing. I can't remember the name for it. I'm losing my English as I'm learning German, but the, what, what you write your exams in. And you get a list of 10 questions that your instructor has written up and you choose three. And then you answer three questions in three hours. You just sit there for three hours writing answers, writing your, your answers. Now the thing that you know, you learn as advice and then you give to other students as, for advice is when it comes to answering those three questions, you know, you don't just like take the first one and start writing. You have to make a plan for what you're going to argue in every single question. I mean, it doesn't have to take you a long time, but you have to sketch it out for all three and then figure out how much time you have left, divvy that up and make sure you give yourself enough time for each question in order to get full points on all of them. So it does, if you've gone through the British university system, you've had that experience of having to figure out how to construct an argument succinctly <laughs> under pressure and then to be able to just kind of wing it. And that was a very good experience for the debate, clearly, I think for me. But in addition to that, there are some really important things that we would tell our students, you know, when I got to the side of, of the desk of being the lecturer, which is when you go to answer an essay question or you go to answer an exam question, there are three strategies for what to do. The first is answer the question directly. And that's the best thing. If the question says, why does this happen in this country and not this country? You can say, this happens in this country, but not this country because of these three factors. Factor one, blah, 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 factor two. Blah. Um, answer the question. If you can't answer the question because you're not really confident about it, you're not sure you know it, then you should redefine the question into something you can't answer. So you'd say, Okay, well, yes, the, there's this difference between country A, uh, X, and Y, but the really interesting difference is between A and B. And I'm going to talk about this because it's more, you know, it's it's got similar elements, but um, it's and it's more important than talking about X and Y. And that way, you're trying to get partial credit for what you do know. And then the last step is if you have no idea about the question, waffle on as much as you can, showing as much as you know, and hope for the best. <laughs> well, that, that, that was that was certainly. Uh, uh, very descriptive uh, for for anybody who doesn't who didn't know um, the the way that you at least went around uh, preparing for the debate and, and what you learned in the process. So that was very insightful. Uh, but I, I would like to. I actually I kind of kind of said something just just off the top of my head. I didn't really. Um, I don't know if you wanted to come back and challenge it. Like I, I said that it was uh, debates are subjective, but really I, I guess. An argument could be made that they're they're really not because especially in a formal debate there are ways that you can objectively win or lose right i think people's perception of how someone performs can be more subjective based on whether or not they're favorable or unfavorable to that particular person but when it comes down to the kind of going through the basics of what a debate what you should be doing and your side of the debate yeah i think that there are you can do a very bad job um, even if people are rooting for you and maybe you know making excuses for you, um, that if you don't do the basics, you can't really have said to to do a good job. Well, I, I think it boils down to you know the standard of evidence, right? Who who performs uh, with the burden of proof better for their side, right? Yeah, I think that that that's really what it comes down to is who, when it comes to directly answering the question that they're debating, who presented the more convincing argument. And, you know, it doesn't have to be rhetorical skill. I think, you know, Christopher Hitchens didn't sway people because he was doing rhetorical magic. He was making a lot of sense and he was opening up areas for people to question where they hadn't questioned before. So, yeah, um, doing a good job is a, I think doing a good job at a debate involves bringing together a lot of things. Um, but I, I know that there's been kind of this kickback now afterwards. I've noticed that uh, people are like, oh, debates are bad and debates are stupid and debates don't accomplish anything. Well, it's kind of, yeah, ironic, not ironic, but you know it's okay for when it, we're talking about Hitchens or Dawkins or Dennett or Harris but suddenly when it comes down to youtubers oh debates they're rubbish they don't accomplish anything anymore so yeah and, and I am obviously I disagree with that like, I think there is something to be said for informal debates certainly and, and conversations and but more like dialogue related sort of thing where it's back and forth communication which is really what we usually do during our our chats with anti-feminists and things like that but um, uh, there is certainly something to be 
a great value in, in holding an actual formal debate um, because not everything is, is, is relative and it's good to actually be held to strict rules about the facts. So I think I we really need to see more of that in, in the online, certainly skeptical community. Right. And to do that, in my opening statement, I knew I had actually a very tall task ahead of me. I know people were saying that the question was very open and probably unfair to the person answering no, but I saw my tasks as two things. One, to identify the strong arguments in favor of my position, and also to anticipate the best possible argument that my opponent can make. And it seemed to me that the most, um, the most powerful argument someone can make to the to answer no to the question, is feminism good for the world, would be to say, oh, yeah, well, we needed feminism in the past, but things are much better now, and so we don't really need it anymore. That seemed to me to be the, the most a powerful um, issue because you, know, you could look at a bunch of laws, you could look at attitudes on women's place in society, and we've seen quite a lot of progress in, in the West. Um, so I um, had, again, to present my case in the positive while also trying to anticipate and counter any what I perceive to be um, the negative argument. And um, my job was in 10 minutes to defend first, second, and third wave feminism, both in the West and across the world. Um, that was no small task. <laughs> and I had to figure out how to move through the time periods in a way that made sense to move both globally and locally, going you know, from the big down to the small, to the relatable, to things that would matter to the people in the audience. And, and also, I knew that going into it, that I wasn't going to be convincing Carl of changing his position, nor would I be you know, changing the position of most of the people that had come there to watch him pwn me. But I figured there was probably going to be a lot of people who hadn't made up their minds yet or were watching as a curiosity. And I thought if I can um, really make the case, argue it to those people, argue to the people who are um, interested in what I have to say without booing at the camera as soon as I come on, then that would be the target um, sort of audience. Because if you watch Hitchens or if you watch Airmen, when they debate the Christians, a lot of times they appeal to the audience saying, you know, I'm asking you to think in your own heart, how much of this can you really believe? And that would is, is what, you know, again, you have a debate opponent, but I didn't really think my message was for Carl. My message was more for everybody else who wasn't kind of in the YouTube bubble. And that was a lot to get done in 10 minutes. And that was the task that I had, I saw before me. Yeah, and, and that's definitely something that we, we, we got from watching uh, Hitchens debates was he was never really interested in um, convincing the opponent like that's that's not the point of a formal debate, I guess, is what I learned from him. It was about communicating with the audience, and um, the, the the biggest success comes when you can plant a seed of doubt in those who come into the debate strongly opposed to your beginning position. So, th th just swinging somebody to the maybe position is is a, a victory for a debater uh, in a formal debate, whereas the kind of informal chats that we do with anti-feminists it's more about reaching out to them directly and understanding their perspectives and things like that um as opposed to making general uh, appeals to um well to logic and evidence for the sake of the audience although that also happens but um as far as as far as what you felt was their strongest point um i guess uh, against modern feminism, of course, hindsight is always is always twenty twenty, and few people are willing to argue that feminism had no good to offer the world ever uh, or anywhere. And um, so, it, it's obviously going to be much harder to prove something that is ongoing uh, to be a positive force. Uh, yeah, um, and so I mean, I, I again, I thought um, that the the strongest argument would be one of those sort of divide and conquer divide first second wave feminism away from intersectional feminism and try to farm that off as its own sort of thing but uh, that's um that's not what carl did so but um just as um uh, before i get ahead of myself into his first uh, prepared remarks or his prepared remarks all of his remarks were prepared remarks so but anyway um yeah so i i worked with uh i worked 
you know, for a couple days, you know, kind of thinking about how I wanted to do my opening and building up a little bit of the narrative and then going through and looking at the citations and consulting books and making sure that I had everything sort of uh, dotted my uh, I's and crossed the T's and rehearsed it. And that was the other thing. I probably rehearsed the opening three or four times and to get the pacing right, to make sure that I was making the best use of my 10 minutes, that I could read it in a slow and sort of casual way without being rushed at the end. So the rehearsal part was also very important uh, in terms of coming into the debate and feeling like I could be confident that I could do my bit without be being cut off at the end. Yeah, and you really made fantastic use of your time. Uh Carl or, or Sargon, rather, I, I, whichever. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's he, he, yeah, he, he's yeah. open about his name. Um, he, uh, he, we were keeping track of, of the time that he was giving up. Uh, you know, we were going to like give some of it back to him at some point. Uh, he didn't really have any interest in that, but um, you made fantastic use of your time. Like just a few seconds left in, in pretty much all of your statements, and because uh, it, it was, of course, all timed every single. Uh, step of the debate and uh, I see professional debaters like struggling with that they'll start getting cut off by the moderator and they'll start trying to rush through it real quick uh, but or power through and, and then get muted or at mm -hmm. least they should get muted um, so that doesn't happen often enough I think in formal debates um, so I, I felt like you really made a great great use of your time well, thank you. That was my aim. It's kind of like leaving money on the table. You know, you don't want to leave right. money on the table or seconds on the table and you could be saying something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you, you said uh, that you wanted to talk about Carl's debate strategy. And of course, I would rather hear this uh, from Carl's perspective first, and then we can we ideally would go back and forth between what you think of him and what he thinks of you in terms of your... Well, maybe opinion. think what he said and what I said. If we talk about what we think of each other, we probably would get off the debate topic really quick. Well, no, no, no. Just, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about in terms, not, not personally, in terms yeah, of yes, his yeah. strategy. Yeah. But, but yeah. Uh, well, of course, he, he, he hasn't yet showed up. I'm still still holding up. Hope for you, Carl. <laughs> um, so, so maybe, uh, but go, go ahead and, and tell us your thoughts on his debate strategy. Well, I actually hadn't watched the debate. Um, I hadn't watched it. I hadn't watched myself, you know, after uh, it was done. I kind of finished up that day, and um, and and like Carl admitted, I was a, I wasn't probably as nervous as him because I've taught before. But it was certainly a an un, a new situation for me, and and it was there was a, you know some adrenaline in there, and so yeah, I just sort of um, had gotten on with my day and decided I didn't want to relive it immediately, and then kind of never got around. To watching it but when we decided you know we we're going to do this chat then um actually in the last few hours i went back and i i watched him well the first thing was you know i wasn't i couldn't see what he was doing when i was doing my bits because i was trying to make eye contact with the webcam and i he was down in the corner and what i noticed when I, I, I was just gonna fast, I knew what i said so i was just gonna fast forward through my bit but i was curious to see if he had taken any notes during the section, because one of the things I noticed when I saw the H. Bomber guy excerpt from the debate was that he was just sort of sat there, and whenever he's talking, you see the top of my head because I'm looking down, I'm taking notes on what he's saying. And so I, I did kind of like go through, fast forward my bit, and he doesn't take any notes. He didn't take a single note on anything I said, and now I know why, and that's because he had never really per, um, either understood or had been prepared for an actual spontaneous discussion. So he didn't take any notes during mine, and then he read off his comments in his section. And the thing about his section is, it's really hard for me to see where he answers the question, is feminism good for the world? Now, people have said in the comments of various things that we were talking past each other. We were talking past each other because Carl wasn't answering the question. And if you, I went back and he, but he, after he sort of like does some well poisoning by saying, oh, thanks, Christy, for debating me because most of these feminists hide themselves away in academia. So it's sort of a well poisoning, pretending to be a compliment. But then he makes the assertion that feminism is a social science. And from that point on until almost the end, he just goes on to attack social science for like the six or six and a half minutes that he spoke. He talked about, um, well, there's just so many mistakes. And now that I go back and I kind of look at it, I was taking notes at the time, but you know, um, you're trying to hear what he's saying and follow. I was trying to, I, I thought 
he would be making an argument. I kept thinking this is going to lead to something. This is going to lead to something. It's going to come back to come back to feminism. It's going to come back to feminism. It just does, doesn't. It it really didn't. What he ends up doing is um, first questioning the idea that when people ask things to gather data, that this is somehow um, not credible. But then he goes on to cite a bunch of social studies results as his argument that the social sciences aren't credible. And he talks about, for instance, there was a, I, I thought about whether or not to bring this up during the live debate. And it was one of those things where I felt like it was going to be getting off topic. So I decided to not do it. But now that I have the opportunity, one of the things that he brought up was this study that found that 75% of social psychology studies that this group tried to replicate did not produce the same findings as the original. And that was his evidence that social science should not be considered credible. But what he doesn't sort of have the understanding of the scientific process to reflect back on is that's just one study. That study too would need to be replicated to see if its results could could be matched by another another group of people. That's what science do. Like that's what scientists do. We replicate prior findings to see whether or not they work. And this is it's the over time stuff that produces these, um, you know, more um, substantial findings. You know, we looked at it through the natural sciences back when we had crappy instruments and we had um, some error in our instruments or we didn't realize the extent to which the atmosphere was interfering with our ability to me measure a star. Uh, so, yeah, I was just like, I, I think I was so flummoxed because, again, I come back to that tradition of answering the question, you know, answer the question, answer the question, answer the question. And it's really difficult to make an argument about feminism being good for the world or not when the other side of the debate is really just attacking social science while calling it feminism which is a false premise to begin with so just when i went back and was trying to follow along the amount of time he spends on american university faculty who are identified as left or left-leaning he then equates them to being democrats when there's the green party and there are apolitical people and all kinds of stuff i mean it was just very I, I still don't understand how he could spend so much time going after social science and in particular American universities and academics and American universities when the issue is, is feminism good for the world? And that's why we were talking past each other. It's not because Carl was talking about a different version of feminism than I was. It's because he wasn't answering the question directly from what I can see um, you know, in any meaningful way. If, I, if it was an essay, I would have, it would have been that waffle on about everything you know on a topic for as long as you can, because it, it certainly didn't, I mean, if you were to summarize, you know, why did Carl think feminism was not good for the world? You wouldn't be able to do it because, with that opening statement. And that kind of really set the debate off on a, on a really skewed track, because then I was not, you know, when I was talking in my rebuttal, I wasn't trying to bring it back to feminism. We ended up off on, on topics of social science. So, yeah, I have to say that I just kind of, having watched his, his opening statement again now after so many months, um, yeah, I, I hope he watches this because he needs to, he really needs to get better if he wants to keep doing debates. <laughs> and so, I hope he takes the advice that I give in the first part of this video. So you, you felt that he was generally off topic uh, talking about his distrust of academia and social science, and then also using those same things as his sources. Is that, that your main criticism, aside from being off topic, like I said? Yeah, in some ways I felt like it was more directed at me. It was more directed to discredit me as a social scientist and to discredit me as a sort of like associated with American academia, even though I taught at British universities and I work now in Germany. So it felt less like an honest debate attempt and more of an attempt to undermine my, my entire discipline and profession, um, you know, and that I was very, again, flummoxed at how to try to get the debate back on, on topic, so. I see, and, and you also mentioned uh, the note taking and, and his posture, uh, like during the debate. Um, did you wanna elaborate on that a little bit? Well, okay, yeah, so then, um, so he did his bit, and I was taking notes and trying to decide 
all right, am I gonna go off on this, the fact that he's citing one study um, that only you know, found this one result that also needs to be replicated, or am I gonna take up this issue of his attacking data? Or, you know, and I basically sort of have to, to figure out in my response time, because he hadn't really answered the question how to, to get back to it. So I gave my response, and again, watching the video, he takes no notes. He takes no notes whatsoever as to what I say during my response. And then in his first response, he just reads off of a script. He just, he like, he had no intention of hearing anything I was going to say. He had no intention engaging with anything that I had presented. He had sort of like three prepared scripts that he was going to read out, apparently, no matter what I said. And I just, like, I get ahead and realized this until today. And it's just shocking to me. I think it was kind of like, you know, H. Bomber guy, whenever he starts dissolving into laughter, um, I wish I had that laugh because yeah, I just like, um, I don't know how you could ever watch a debate and think that all that all they do is get up and read pre-prepared remarks that have nothing to do with what the person who's gone before has just said. So that I found quite astounding. Okay. And, and you, you talked about, you mentioned well poisoning. Do you want to, do you want to clarify on that? Is, a, is, is that just a, a reference to his distrust of academia and social science? Well, he basically said um, he wanted to thank me. His first line I was to genuinely thank me for coming out in debate because oftentimes feminists hide themselves away in academia. And of course, now he's hiding from Professor Moriarty who wants to debate him. So that's a little bit of a turning of the position on that issue. But there were other times. I mean, I think again, in, in, um, I, I went through and I didn't have time to watch the whole thing. I in particular wanted to watch his opening and to see his responses because really after that, they started to get um, ad hominem attacks, you know, about making comments about people's hair color and uh, wearing makeup and being promoted for jobs that they're unqualified for. It just became a series of, of attacks that I think were really more designed to get me to be emotional than to really make, again, it, n nothing it really um, was aimed at answering the question. I think, you know, for him, I thought, I don't, it just seemed like he was never serious about trying to provide a robust defense of why feminism is not good for the world. And other than to saying that, you know, feminists are horrible people. Um, so, yeah, I felt like there was a, a, an excessive amount of ad hominem attacks, um, that there were, there were a ton of straw men. And when it was going on, you know, when he was giving his side and would make an unfounded statement, I... I had to make a decision because I was listening to it and I thought about interrupting him and asking for the citation. And actually this was like in his first opening thing, but uh, or at least in one of the responses. And I decided at that point that if I did that, I would probably be criticized for it. Um, if I interrupted him every time he did that, because I would be interrupting him every few seconds. And so I decided to not do that and to kind of hold it together for the, the response times. Um, and yeah, it, it felt, you know, if, if, I, if he would have done some actual research into answering the question instead of attacking social science, um, because yeah. feminism is not social science, and that was the fundamental premise of his opening statement. So, okay, so it's, it's not social science. Could you clarify on the distinction there then? Because I, I, I would think that he would disagree with you there. Well, social science is a group of um, fields that take as their subjects human beings and their societies and then breaks down into different categories as to how we analyze it. So the economic study is economics, you know, we, that's a social science, anthropology, um, uh, communications and media, that's a, you can look at that from marketing points of view and you can be a social science. You've got sociology, the study of people in the aggregate, you've got psychology, the study of individuals, you've got social psychology, the study of individuals and groups, you've got political science, um, and then you've got, you know, the study of religion and all other kinds of things that you can do. So the social sciences are really a, a series of disciplines that use the scientific approach as applied to the individual and the social. Whereas feminism is, well, feminism can be uh, a, a mean different things. It can be an ideology, a set of ideas that hang together. It can be the concept of feminist feminism. It can be the, describing the movement, a feminist movement, or it can be describing a theoretical framework, feminist theory, feminist critique. So the, the question is really, you know, it's, you can use feminist theory in the social sciences, in economics, for instance, to understand differences in wages or whatever else you want to, like household income, 
all those kinds of things. You can look at feminist theory and to try to help you understand that better. But that doesn't make feminism a social science. It's, it's like the difference between, you know, the scientist is the person, you know, in the lab looking at it, and then the microscope is a tool, you know, to help you get at it, you know, or it's, it's a theoretical lens. It's um, it, in, in the natural sciences, except for when I can think of the example of that light be, is both a wave and a particle. There's usually one right answer in the natural world. Gravity has a certain calculation, you know, the weight at which things fall. But in the social sciences, you can have a, many different explanations that take up certain parts of the phenomenon. An example would be in the United States, you can do a really good job predicting who's going to be the president if you just know what people's economic evaluations are. You can do, you can pr predict um, the outcome in presidential races knowing economic evaluations like almost all the time. But that doesn't mean people just go and vote because of the economy. They vote for a lot of different reasons. So the economy is a good proxy measure, but it's not the whole story. The whole story is more complicated. And that's what we wrestle with as social scientists is that human beings in life are complicated, but we still can observe them and we can still measure things and we can still apply principles of falsification to make a testable hypotheses to see if we can predict outcomes um, as a way of creating knowledge. And one of the ways that we can do that is by using feminist theory. Okay, well, uh, sorry for a really long answer. No, 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 that, that, that's fine. So as I recall, though, you did say that gender is something that is like in a societal sense is something that needs to be viewed through a feminist lens to be understood. Is that, is that correct? And that sounds yeah, and like, like a type of social science, does it not? Well, again, the science is the practice. So the science would be, what is my question? What is my answer? How am I collecting my data? What statistical methods or other methods of analysis am I using? And, and how am I writing up my conclusions? That's the process. Where feminism would come in here is when it comes to like how when I study my my question, if it is about uh, notions of gender, then yeah, a, a big, if you want to understand how maybe notions of gender have changed over time, you're going to be going and reading literature about gender theory and that's going to be written by feminists. So it's just like saying if I want to go and study um, how one species um, be, you know, can evolve into another species, you're going to be using the theory of evolution but you're going to be doing biology. Uh, okay. All right. I, 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 I think I'm tracking with you now. Uh, okay. Well, would you say that feminism is then more like a, like an, like a theory or an ideology versus uh, social science, like economics? Um, no. So in economics, you might want to understand why there are pay differences between men and women. And you would use feminist theory to look at the way that we have had pink collar jobs. What jobs have women when they did when they were allowed to enter the workforce? What jobs were they allowed to take? At what rate were they paid compared to men? Let's say teaching, for instance, male pe teachers for a long time in the States, you know, back in Laura Ingalls Wilder day, were paid, men were paid more because it was assumed that they had to take care of a family. That sexual discrimination and pay was built in from the beginning. So then you can use that information to track how those tr traditions, how those practices have changed over time. So a theory just is a, a theory is a way for you to, it's a little story. Let me see if I can give you an example. Um, in economics and also in social science, we use what's called rational choice theory. And the principle behind rational choice theory is that human beings are going to do whatever's best for them. Whatever, as we'd say, maximizes their utility. That's, if we make an equation, that's the U on the, in the equation. Then we say, but for every action, there are going to be a probability of a benefit, some costs, and then maybe some other things we don't know. So your utility is equal to the probability of you getting a benefit from something minus any costs that you have to experience. Let's say that you're a college student and you have to go to the grocery store and you only have $5 in your pocket and you need to buy beer and dishwashing liquid. Well, you're probably not going to go for the most expensive dishwashing liquid if you want to save all your money for beer. So you're going to find the cheapest thing because to maximize your utility and get the benefit that you want, which is detergent that will clean your dishes, you're going to pay probably the least amount possible. Now, if you are a middle class family and you're very eco friendly and you have a rather comfortable disposable income and you are very into recycling, then when you go to the grocery store, you might get an eco friendly 
dishwashing liquid because the benefit to you of not harming the environment is worth the cost you get. The probability of not harming the environment is worth the extra cost because what you get out of that makes up for it. We take this principle and we apply it to voting. What is the, um, how well can we understand people's vote choice or decision to vote, let's say, to go to the polls or not, using rational choice theory? Well, according to rational choice theory, your costs for going to an election involve learning about the candidates, learning about their positions, maybe um, you know, gas to get to the poll, maybe arranging childcare, maybe you have to go to special time, you have to get up early because of your work schedule. There are all of these costs involved with going to cast your ballot. And in terms of the benefit, the way they calculated it is, what is the probability that your individual vote will be the one that makes the decision to put your candidate into office? That probability is infinitesimal. It's very small. The chances of you being the one vote that actually makes Hillary Clinton the next president is almost nothing. So you have all of these costs associated with the voting, time, money, effort, information, and this really small payout in terms of what the actual election outcome is likely to be. According to rational choice theory, it's not rational to vote. It's a complete waste of your time. Yet, people vote. So there's one theory that's not very good at explaining voting. It's great at explaining how and why people buy dishwashing liquid, but we can't use that theory to help us understand why people go to the polls. So it must be something else. So then we would go to a different theory, like um, civic duty, people feel an obligation to vote. Or you'd go to things like expressiveness, people feel um, an expressive benefit in casting their votes. So theories are just like kind of little stories about how things would work if this theory was right. And then what we do with these, our testable hypotheses is we, we make tests of that theory. If the world is truly like rational choice, what would we expect the world to look like? And then the, you know, to the extent to which that theory does a good job of predicting what the world looks like, we think it's a good theory. And if it's really rubbish, we go, okay, we're not gonna use that theory anymore. And that's, that's what it's like to do social science. Well <clears throat> but if you're looking for something to fit a narrative of a given social theory, are you not then automatically biased toward only searching for what fits? Well, theories can be either deductive or inductive, and inductive theories come upon uh, with observation. So let's say um, we have, uh, I'm trying to think of how to make this fit. We have in our qualitative election study of Britain, we found repeated times now in focus groups that people will talk about a political leader in terms of his, in the UK it's been all men, except for like Nicholas Sturgeon, I stand corrected, and Natalie Bennett and Leanne Woods, so I'll say men or women, sorry. We had more um, potential candidates in 2015. Um, we find that even if people don't really rate their personality very well, and they don't rate how much they trust them very well, if they think that person is a competent leader, Whoever in our focus groups comes out as the leader um, is performing most competently across the country, despite party affiliation and, and national location. That person is usually, it has been in the last couple of elections, the person whose party wins, um, you know, uh, Downing Street. They are become the party in power. So what we could do based on that is say, okay, what we're going to do is, is examine the extent to which leadership is the most important thing, even above trust and even above how, how charming their personality is. And if we could develop a way to then deductively create a testable hypothesis, you would go into the world and you would, so the way that a null hypothesis works is you assume that your theory is wrong. You assume your theory doesn't tell you anything about the world and you set the limits of saying, okay, well, if I get this result of uh, p-value of the probability of this uh, coefficient appearing in the population from which the sample was drawn, um, I would have to have um, five errors out of every hundred times I performed this sampling, drew a sample. I will tolerate five, a chance of five errors out of every 100 samples and say, yes, that's, that's, that's right. And you can go down to one chance out of 100 or one chance out of 1,000. A P equals uh, less than 0, 0,1 or less than 0, 0, 0,01. And P equals less than 0, 0, 0,01 is the highest level of confidence we have that our sample reflects the population. So we would create a deductible, a deductive theory, and then we would 
create a sample, we would draw from a sample and administer the questions and we would run the statistical analysis. And before we even ran the statistical analysis, we'd know what the cutoff points were. So it's not like we go out into the world and we construct things um, and then we go looking for confirmable um, evidence. That's pseudoscience. That's what astrology does. <laughs> so the test of a theory is first assuming you're wrong and putting the burden of proof on your theory to show that it's right. That was the contribution of Popper. That was the, the thing that I think, I know there's correspondence theory and there's a lot of other things that you can think about what makes science science, what makes science different from pseudoscience. For me, it really comes down to the principle of falsification because every time you run a statistical test as a social scientist, you're assuming your theory is wrong and you're waiting to see if the data says, no, your theory is right. I see. What so, Maybe you've already answered this to the best of your ability, but because okay, it sounds like you sort of did, but uh, um, maybe I'm being exceptionally slow, or maybe we can just say it's for the benefit of our audience. Ah, burn, <laughs> audience, burn. Um, using the null hypothesis, how do we test feminist theory? Like, how do we prove it? Sure, I have a whole thesis that does this. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, so. Uh, what you could do, for instance, let's just take a, a classic finding that, um, and we've seen this based on observation, that in, in the UK, and, and I don't want to speak to anything other than the UK because that's where I've done my research, but what you find is that generally women are more likely to agree with statements such as censorship is, is necessary for the protection of moral goods. Um, and like the rights of the uh, individuals, you know, should not endanger the country. There's this, there's this uh, axis of um, libertarian to um, sort of like not author, authoritarian, authoritarian. To what extent do you think the state should be involved in people's private lives? And in the UK, women generally, still performed, uh, always outperformed men on that. Men are more um, libertarian in that sense than women are. And in my analysis, I looked at uh, the notions of agency and communion, the ex agency being the extent to which you feel you're autonomous in the decisions that you make and that you can kind of create your own life. And communion, which is analogous to the norms of feminism, and that is how connected are you with other people? And so the prediction was that, you know, in these situations, if you have measures for agency and communion, you should be able to predict and reduce the sex effect. If it is the case that what is really driving these differences is not uh, a biological or some sort of physical kind of thing, but a social thing. Um, parenthood would also be a physical thing, by the way. And when I ran my analysis, uh, most of my measures, I could actually make the sex effect go away, which meant that it wasn't so much being a man or woman that would, for instance, make you left wing or right wing, but really um, agentic women with a high sense of their own agency would be more right wing than communal women. And men with a high sense of communion would be more left wing than men with a high sense of their own agency. So it was really these gender norms that were better predicting people's political attitudes and behaviors. But when it came to the question of this libertarian authoritarian scale, even when controlling for um, agency and communion, women were still more leaning on, uh, there was still some explanation of women uh, being a woman being associated with these views. So maybe there are other things in there that I wasn't picking up on. So being able to understand the way in, in which gender norms and roles operate in a society and also on an individual level comes right out of a feminist tradition of questioning patriarchy and questioning the notion that women are always nurturing, men are always autonomous, and recognizing that as human beings, we have a range of this. And I know that this sounds really commonplace today, that people can be independent and being emotionally connected. But in the 1970s, when this stuff started, People really thought that your sex, your gender identity, and your masculinity or femininity were all bound up. And if you had um, a, a variation in that, you, were, you had a problem. There was something wrong with you. So it was really this feminist critique of limited 1950s madmen kind of lifestyles and, and, and societies that really allowed people now these days to be the full range of humans that they are. So I, I'm kind of feel like um, in terms of you know, the testing thing, I've kind of wandered off on, but basically, um, if you want to know how feminist theory can inform social research using data and testable statements, 
I've read out my entire thesis. It has a whole section on how to understand statistics as well. And uh, I go through all of the charts and all the coefficients and the R squareds and explain what they all mean. So feminists, you know, I, I do use feminist theory in my research um, quite often. It's not the only theory I use, but it's certainly a valuable one because of the rich history of feminist theory when it comes to understanding and reflecting on the way societies construct norms for men and women and what their behaviors are meant to be. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that extremely detailed answer. I, I do appreciate it and um, I'm probably gonna have to re-listen to it a few times um, for the benefit of other people who are <laughs> not as smart as me. Just and, to plug, uh, I have a series called How to Social Science 101 on my channel. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I've yeah. left off, I got a little bit busy, but I am going to be continuing on with it when I go on vacation, so. Yeah, it's fantastic. I highly recommend it. Uh, as well as your, um, I don't know if it's a series, but your videos on patriarchy, which people are also asking how you would prove, uh, yeah. you know, empirically. <laughs> so, uh, Christy, Christy's on top of that stuff. And uh, it's, it's one of the reasons we really, really enjoy her content is, is she <laughs> tackles things that people are usually, f as you say, flummoxed by. Uh, but how does one combat uh, internal bias when performing these, uh, these social science tests? Like it, it would be much harder to do, I, I would imagine, than the so-called hard sciences, right? Well, it's not so much the bias, it's, um, so, you, you know, when you start working, if I start working on a paper, I don't just come up with my own ideas. We have these extensive literature reviews where you kind of have to go back to the first person who wrote this book and their groundbreaking ideas. Like for me, with the agency and communion, it was Bakken, uh, David Bakken, and I've cited him a number of times. And then you sort of work your way through, I worked my way through the 70s and the big studies in the 80s and the important studies in the 90s. So as an academic, just like in philosophy, you have to go back and kind of give the origins, you have to give the genealogy. Of, of where you are, your literature, your findings are located. Because people will want to, um, they'll need to know sort of what gap is your data, is your study filling? What, do you, what is your contribution to knowledge here? And you show that contribution by first showing the gap. So you show where there's a, a missing bit or this hasn't been studied yet or it's not been studied in this context. Um, and then a lot of times you don't work with your own data. If you're doing election study analysis, these are big studies that cost sometimes millions of dollars or pounds. So there are teams of academics. The, the ones uh, in the US are based at Michigan. I think it's Ann Arbor. They run the American election study. And then in Britain, the current team is based at Manchester. And actually in the UK, um, they have to bid there's a, a body, a funding body, the Economic Social Research Council, and academics compete. They each write their own bids for the amount of money, I think you know, it's like 1.2 million or something that they can spend. The ESRC gives them all these requirements, like it has to do X and Y and Z, and it has to have these kinds of things. Academics write the bids for those and then compete for them, and then the winning bid gets to take over the study. So that's how they do it in Britain. And so they have a long running survey that they do and they might tweak it a little bit, but their job as the election study is really just to keep the data flowing, is to keep the tradition, keep the lines of questions that have been asked going all the way back to the 1970s continued to be asked and then making little changes to update as, as we go along. So when you get the data, it's not even, you, you haven't even collected it. And even when it comes down to the data that I work with for my research, YouGov normally does my data collection. I, I don't have the money to go out and you know, create a panel. So we end up using uh, people in the, in the private market who do these, this kind of thing for a living, Ipsos Mori or YouGov or some of these other, these other um, places. And then you get the, you get the data and it is what it is. Um, and a lot of, too, a lot of the ESRC funding projects now make it a requirement that you deposit your data with a data archive. And a lot of academic journals are requiring that if you're going to publish in our journal, you have to make your data available. And they do that, one, because it's really expensive to collect data and a lot of people should have the chance to use it. But when it comes to publishing, people need to be able to replicate your results. And it's, it's been really fantastic in the last, you know, 15 years with the rise of the internet before it would be very difficult to send, you know, these uh, people had punch card computers, you know, back in the 60s when they were doing stuff, you couldn't really just put that up on the internet. But now you can have an SPSS file or your you know, R file or whatever else and just put it up there and then 
anybody can go and try to replicate your results. And if they can't replicate your results, you might have your article withdrawn. And that's why you have peer review and that's why it doesn't happen that often. So the chances of you, you know, being able to, um, especially with like election study data, to pull some crap it would be um, very risky for your career to do so because if you're exposed, once you're exposed, that's it. You, your reputation is, is damaged for life. So there's really no incentive. There's really no incentive for an academic to falsify information in order to get a specific finding. Okay. Um, I, I have I have a question about you know like who you're voting for and stuff, but I, I think we, we can save that for when we get even more off topic, let's bring it back for a minute. Um, yeah. How do you think the, uh, the Q&A session went? I know everybody thinks that, well, not everybody, but uh, a, a large number of people feel that that's where Sargon really shined and, and where he really defeated you. Yeah, I see my impression was, again, I had watched professional debates with uh, people who would make arguments and want their debate performance to be measured on the strength of their arguments. And so the Q&A sessions I had seen was when the audience would have a question and then the speakers would address the audience. And that was what I was expecting. I thought that the questions would come to us from the audience to clarify comments that we made. And then we would each sort of go back. But really what it, you know, Carl did was turn it into the, the session that he wanted to have, which apparently was to just, um, demand that I, I so uh, demand that I ask questions that he'd framed in such a way that it was um, it was basically a Paxman move. For those of you who don't know, there's a he's now I think retired, but there was a British broadcaster on for a very long time, Jeremy Paxman, and he was very tough at asking questions. But if you go and do um, uh, if you type Jeremy Paxman, Michael Howard, you will see the video of him asking the same question uh, like 13 times to this one guy, and he didn't want to answer it. But and so I think Carl was trying to pull a bit of a Paxman there, especially like with the Obama question. And it, it really felt like, again, nothing that he was talking about in those sections was coming back to the issue of, is feminism good for the world? It's how can I embarrass Christy in public? And I, I again, I, for, I, I didn't expect it. <laughs> I'm kind of stumbling here because at the moment I, I was very surprised by the viciousness of a lot of his comments. I didn't return those in kind and I didn't speak to him disrespectfully, but he had done that to me. And um, it, when I realized it kind of, I think took me a little while to really catch on to the way that he was turning the question and answer session into and a, a chance to verbally abuse me, basically, that I just took a, a page out of Michael Brooks, which is every time he asked me a question, I would answer it in full. Um, and, and when, you know, he would choose to turn the floor over to me, then like, well, why, you know, why do they need feminism in the Middle East? Well, let me tell you why they need feminism in the Middle East, because first wave feminism deals with issues of legal things. And, in the, you know, and, and that I think he found probably slightly frustrating. So I have to say I was appalled at how he behaved in the question and answer session. I think it was the worst part of his performance, in all honesty, because he did um, I think end up looking very unreasonable. Although, to be honest, I think the, what really hurt him in the debate, what I've seen now multiple times, is when he was laughing at the description of the oral rape case. And I didn't even see it when it happened. I was too busy giving my opening statement. But I think that that has become sort of the defining image um, of him from that debate. And I know looking at H. Bomber guy's comments, a lot of people hadn't seen the debate. And the number of people who just were revo just revolted by his reaction. It was a visceral reaction that they had to the way that he reacted. So I think his emotions really got um, let him down. I think if he had really gone in there with an intellectual approach rather than uh, to go in there with um, an aggressive attack mode, I think he would have done much better. Where do you feel that you went the most strong in the debate and where do you feel that you went the most strong um i don't know that i really felt that i i went wrong in any particular way i mean again i You're i flawed. <laughs> no i mean i think that given the circumstances and again uh, my expectations were that he would actually be slightly professional and that he would answer the question, which, which that didn't happen. So probably if you wanted to see him hate on a feminist and just hurl really horrible things at a woman, then you would really like the last bit because he did that, that quite well. But that doesn't 
give you a reason to, to um, dismiss the arguments I made, you know, just um, venting at people in order to um, demean them rather than dealing with their arguments, that's really not going to win you over a lot of people who, who do base their, their reality and their decisions on arguments and not hateful emotions. Uh, do you feel that he ever tried to attempt to answer the question? Is, is feminism good for the world? You know, I, I did go through. I, I can't, I'm sitting here in front of the notes um, that he made in his opening statement, where, you know, whether it's the social psychology thing and, and replicating studies or um, him mentioning political bias in American universities and how many Democrats and Republicans there are, I just don't see it. I mean, I don't really see, I couldn't give you a line in his opening or very much else that directly answered that question, why he thought feminism wasn't good for the world. So um, not in my opinion. I think it was unfortunately that that was really what let him down. I think he could have had a much better performance if he would have just actually attempted to answer the question and tried to let the evidence speak for him instead of him using, well, I, well, I think this is it. Carl, from what I can see from his behavior, from the fact that he had no intention of actually responding to me, that he had pre-prepared all of his comments and had was basically decided to ignore me and everything I said in the debate before the debate even started, he wasn't there for a debate. He was there to throw red meat at his audience. And that's what let him down, I think. I think that's really what let him down. So people in the chat are asking if you are directly accusing him of misogyny are you uh he was a total asshole and he said very sexist things and i think that that's an accurate description of what happened uh, like can you give us some examples well i think if you just <laughs> i mean yeah he was i mean i don't have his debate memorized the, the thing went on for like 90 minutes so if you want to see i would recommend people go watch h bomber guy's video on it because he has a really nice bit where he has taken all of carl's insults and sort of um, slimmed them down so you just hear like all of the various ways that he insults feminists um, in a very short time period so go check out H Bomber Guy's video, and I think that that section will kind of summarize the disrespect that he brought with him to the debate. Have you seen Sargon's response to the debate? And if you have, what do you think of it? I think he released it like within a few minutes of the of the thing being published. Yeah, I did. I did see that. I actually saw it on the day that it came out, <clears throat> um, and I was happy to see that he acknowledged that he was a jerk. Um, that he let his emotions get the better of him. So that was, that was a good thing for him to do. Um, and I think he was right to say that he didn't have a very good outing and that I disagree with it, the, the idea that he was overprepared. I think he should have studied the concept of debates a bit better. So I think that um, in, in that case, he was really talking more to his fans and the people who were supporting him. That message was you know, more aimed at his audience than I say, I think the general public. Um, but yeah, I did see it and, and he, you know, good on him for acknowledging his shortcomings. Uh, but I have a lot more advice for him based on this video that I think he would benefit from greatly. Um, here's a question. Is equality achievable? And when does the feminism stop if their goals are met? Which goals would that be? Or is feminism just politics? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, 40, when I was growing up in the 70s, gay rights weren't an issue. And I was now in the National Organization of Women who in the 1970s started to acknowledge the issues of, of lesbians and incorporate issues of gay rights into their movement. And there was the critique, of course, that second wave feminism was very much about the focus of bourgeois white women and middle class white women, if you find the term bourgeois, I just mean here like, you know, educated middle class sort of, you know, people who like to shop at Macy's kind of thing. Um, and we recognized, the, you know, people recognized that that was a, um, a massive problem because it was excluding the experiences of a lot of other women. And very recently we've seen trans issues come up into the media and into legislation. I couldn't have anticipated that 
40 years ago. So I think that it's, um, you know, I, I think there's, a, there's a, a mistaken idea out there that feminism is just about passing laws. And if you pass a law, suddenly something's not a problem anymore. But really the laws are just a reflection of things that are already going, that have gone on in the culture. And as you know, just because gay marriage or marriage equality is achieved legally in the United States, that doesn't mean that we don't still have massive problems with bigotry and prejudice and discrimination. And it's the same thing with feminism. You can pass laws, but feminist critique has really moved on basically since the 1970s into the personal is political. And, you know, I, is there some hypothetical future world where people see, you know, basically all genders and races and um, philosophies live and coexist in harmony like in Star Trek? Um, that would be brilliant. But at the moment, you know, um, I'm just working on the problems that I see in front of me. So, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, it's um, the personal is political. And as long as we have, you know, gendered practices that are, I think I called last time we were together about patriarchy being a hangover. You know, the, the fact that we have all these sexist attitudes that are right, come right out of the Bible. Um, but we bring them along with us anyway. We carry them with us from generation to generation. And that's an ongoing problem. Yeah, I, I think the thing that really drew us to your channel straight away was that you, like us, um, were approaching the problem that, that women face. So in other words, feminism um, from the position that a lot of it, or maybe even most of it is derived from uh, religion. And obviously that very much appeals to us uh, being that that is also our position. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's good to, to see whenever you make uh, videos to that end. And, uh, hit, hit, I encourage you to make more of those. <laughs> yeah, I just need more time. I have too many ideas and not enough time. Um, but yeah, I mean, as long as we have religious patriarchy with us, we're always going to have a need for feminist critique. Can you go, like, yeah, you know, because I mean, look at the Bible, you've got instances where, I mean, we always think about, you know, like sort of Mary Magdalene, whatever, as being misrepresented as a whore, but there's a line in, in Exodus, I think it is, where God is reprimanding Aaron and Miriam for talking smack about Moses behind his back, and he, he curses Miriam, but he doesn't curse Aaron because he's a priest and he can't be unclean, but God basically says to Moses, if her, she had said that to her father, would he not have spit in her face? Like, is spitting in your daughter's face like such a common practice that you can just drop that into a conversation with God and, and your God's going to say that to you because he watches you guys spit in your daughter's face so often? Or the story about the, um, the man who went chasing after his wife and ended up like killing her, or, or she was raped, I don't know, there was something, but he ended up like cutting up her body parts and sending them to the tribes of Israel as a sign of what had happened. And you're just like, this is so fucked up. And these books are still being passed around. I mean, you just had in the last week that crazy guy, um, P, uh, Pastor Stephen Anderson, who was saying, if anyone wants to, any woman who wants to hear wants to claim she's my equal, I'll challenge her to an arm wrestling contest. That guy lives in the States right now. and He's got a massive congregation. And so, you know, yeah, patriarchy is alive and well and being preached from the pulpit. And the only difference between the Stephen Anderson guy and a lot of other fundamentalists is that he's willing to go on camera. How many girls and boys are being brought up with this idea that women are really just there to provide babies and clean floors? And that's God's will. That's not even just like sort of, you know, an opinion. It's, it's divine law. That's the kind of patriarchy that even if you're saying that people's re private religious beliefs are their own, they take that in with them to the workplace. They take that with them into social situations. They take that with them when they refuse to shop at Target because there's trans or there's unisex bathrooms. So this idea that somehow we can pass laws to fix patriarchy, patriarchy, as long as the monotheistic religions are around, it was always going to need a feminist critique. The way I see it. Um, so this, this was just for me. What, what do you think is the fixation of anti-fems and their hatred of dyed hair? Because I love that Harley dyes her hair. It's, it's fucking foxy. I love it. Yeah, I, I think it's just another way to dismiss, um, you know, there's a, it, it's a, uh, women especially are seen as being subject to be commented upon 
women's bodies just generally you know i think society um is in such a way that we i mean look at the miss america pageants and the way women are like paraded around and who's the hottest and look at her legs like you know it's, it's yeah it's really weird when you think about it and instead of you know taking up people's arguments it's much easier to dismiss them as you know maybe overweight or dyed hair or um you know wearing some kind of clothing or having some kind of outlook it to me it's just again it, it comes back to a weakness in your arguments and if you, you never saw christopher hitchens having to mock somebody's physical appearance appearance to win a debate or to convince an audience you do that when you're trying to basically show we're the in group and they're the out group and there's a lot of, it seems like, a lot of in-group behavior in that and defining yourselves against other people. And when you're doing that, you don't have to focus on your arguments or your evidence or take on critiques very seriously because you just dismiss someone based on their looks. So I'm, I think it's a rather, um, well, it's, it's not a convincing way to make your case that your movement is a rational one. Are you willing to go ahead and just condemn Islam as a patriarchal religion right now for the benefit of the meowling audience? <laughs> yes, um, Islam and the Judeo-Christian traditions are all patriarchal and they all have elements of misogyny and sexism in them. Okay, thank you. And actually, um, you know, and like, you know, Buddhism, which I practiced for a while, but there's sexism in Buddhism as well. There's sexism in Hinduism. You know, I, I think other than like new age movements, which try to invert the patriarchy in some way or subvert it, um, all long-term religions that were born of a time when patriarchy was practiced and it has been practiced basically all of human history. Um, it, yeah, there's a lot of misogyny in a lot of religious texts and a lot of sexism. Okay. Sorry, I had to pause there. There was a fracking train coming by. Oh, hey, no, no worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, Ivy, Ivy lives by the, on the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> <laughs> wrong side of the tracks being too close to them. Um, so in the debate, it sounded like Sargon was trying to say that he was agreeing with first wave feminism, which is something we hear a lot. Like, oh, I only don't like third wave. And again, that comes back with the whole hindsight 2020 thing. Like, it's really easy to just be like, oh, well, fine, whatever. Before was fine, but now is bad, which I'm sure is exactly what everybody in this who was against the second wave feminism was saying as well. Um, what were your thoughts on that? Um, well, my vague recollection is um, because the question came up in the Q&A section, and I remember being surprised because I thought that he was trying to answer that it wasn't even necessary in like the Middle East. And, I, and that might be false. Um, I'd have to go back and watch it. But that is that something is, that we hear quite often, actually. Yeah, and I had to go, what? <laughs> Not on my face, of course, just on the inside. Uh, because that to me, like, you know, uh, first wave feminism is basically just the establishment of women's legal um, existence in law. And, you know, making an attempt to actually get women onto some kind of equal status. I mean, that's, that was, the legal focus was very much what characterized first wave feminism. We still have that, those elements today, you know, when the FBI changes the rape definitions to include male victims that's sort of you know how first wave you know dealing with the legal issues um so uh, yeah i so i don't think that he actually I, I would have to go back and watch the debate to make sure that i was remembering that correctly though but i don't think he did even defend it for women in the middle east or parts of africa or basically the you know outside the developed world well, which religion which patriarchal religion would you say right now is is the most threatening to people worldwide God, you really have a lot of people who want people here to hate on islam go watch the ban the burqa video guys go watch right? a good feminist critique of banning the burqa because you know what that's interesting there's a, not a lot of comments i've, I've watched that video for like a week now because I, I go back and check the comments and usually with your videos especially ones that have a few hundred you get a lot of comments and i've noticed a suspicious absence <laughs> of comments i don't think the anti-fem people know what to do when they hear a feminist argument against the burqa so i if you guys want to you know if you want to hear about discussions about something related to islam i recommend that you guys go watch that video and give your response to a feminist critique of the burqa that is a fantastic suggestion I yeah, have and, and watch all the ads too sit through all the ads on that video too <laughs> 
Christy Winters, shill for the skeptic. <laughs> I did it for Steve Shives when he first got his Patreon. I had the top five reasons you should subscribe to, you know, to oh, join Steve's Patreon. Because he's also another, you know, like a creator that I really support and like, so. Yeah, no, of course. And I mean, we've had him on, obviously, but, but uh, oh my God, I think you brought up Steve Shives. Now the chat is going to be about <laughs> Steve Shives. Well, you know, it is going on. Me. It is like 11.30 at night here for me, so. Okay, okay. Um, let, me, uh, let, let me get to the last thing that I've written down here. I guess just, just give us your thoughts on, um, on the fallout from the debate, be it to this day or immediately after or what have you. Yeah, so I guess, um, you know, what surprised me I, it was the extent to which um, people have picked up and, and used it. You know, I, I wasn't, I didn't know H Bomber guy would be putting it in his video and I've seen it pop up, um, I think, you know, a couple other times. And it makes me, uh, so I, like I said, I, I had my debate. I was kind of had the rest of the day to myself to relax. And, and of course your friends tell you, you do a good job, you know, because they're your friends. They love you. What are they going to say? But um, it, you, I did have, you know, people coming up and, or reading other people's comments about my performance saying that was it was it was strong which was really gratifying for me because again first time i wasn't all that confident um and what was disappointing was the number of people who because they didn't like the outcome decided to dismiss debates as a way to have a dialogue and yeah you can like you said you guys have conversations and that's one kind of thing that you can do in terms of exchanging ideas. But the, the thing about a formal debate is that it makes, it forces you, if you do it properly, to be really rigorous about what you're thinking and what you're saying and why you're communicating what you want to communicate and how you want to communicate it. And there's a discipline to that that I learned through doing it that is unlike just getting on a conversation with someone and having a bit of a chat. Um, it does force you to think very strategically about how your points link up to each other and are there any weaknesses in your presentation or in your logic or in your sources and, and, and how do you go about fixing that or how do you change your argument. There is a, a lovely elegance to that that we are missing out and I know that it, it's a little bit harder in this community because there's a lot of emotions and antagonisms that have gone before but I really do hope that other people would model themselves on the format that you guys presented and, and hosted, maybe not with me, but, you know, to try to introduce some of this more rigorous thinking and presentation of facts, and also to have a situation where people have response times that are set rather than talking over each other so that you can finish your sentence, you can make a specific point that you choose to in your response time. I think all of these things would actually benefit the, the discipline and the rigor of the community. I think that's a good, uh, good, good place to leave off on, unless you have any other uh, comments that you'd like to make. Only that you guys rock, and don't forget to turn off your ad block for The Skeptic Feminist, and, oh, uh, and put all like right. three ads on this, and everyone sit through all of them. That's it. Oh my god, all right. Oh my non-patriarchal god. <laughs> Feminism is my god now. Woo! All right, well, uh, I just wanna, I just wanna leave this off with, um, I love Isis. She's my favorite rat in the world. And uh, thank you very much.